Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by SnapTerms, online legal protection made simple. Visit snapterms.com and enter the code TWIST to receive 10% off. And by Citrix GoToMeeting, meeting is believing. Visit gotomeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and sign up for a 30-day trial. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, shit. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Thank you. Uh, so I talk about growth a lot, and specifically about marketing. So I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I'm going to talk about the two other pieces. So I was thinking through this, and I was trying to figure out sort of a framework. I like to think in frameworks, because I think they're more helpful as you're going up in your career and you're building companies. And so I think about, how do I think about the process of growth? Where do I start? What steps do I go in? And it turns out, I actually think that you do these things one at a time. You do them in a specific order. And the marketing piece of it, where you go out and you tell everybody in the world about it, should be at the end of that process. And increasingly, I see people get really excited about what they're building. They haven't actually built the product yet, or it's not the right product, or they haven't tested it in the market, or done any sort of product market fit, and yet they're out there spending money on Facebook telling the world about it, right? And so it doesn't make a lot of sense. They certainly haven't crafted their message and figured out how do they explain it to the world, right? And still they're spending money. And it doesn't make sense because that's not going to be very efficient. So we're going to talk about the first two steps, which is first building. How do you build the right product? How do you test that you're building the right product? How do you make sure that customers actually want what you're building? And then we're going to talk about messaging. Messaging is how do you explain your product? How do you communicate it really clearly? We talked a lot about this tonight when we were talking about your pitches. I would say, so do you do this? Why don't you say this in a different way? Why don't you use this example? Why are you different from your competitors? That's all in messaging. And marketing is that last piece. Once you have the right product built and you know how to explain it to people, how do you then use those channels to tell it to the world? Right? So we're going to go through each of these. So the first one is building the right product. And I use this example, that products are like bridges. And I learned this metaphor from Jack. He has a specific one that he likes. If you've ever seen Jack on Twitter, you know that he is obsessed with the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, you would think that he built the damn thing based on how he talks about it. He loves the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, I use a different one. So we're going to talk about this bridge. I think it's a really useful metaphor as you think through this. So bridges. When you build a product, the first thing to think about is what is the problem? What's the problem you're solving? Is there some issue? Is there some issue that people have that's real? Right? So we'll go over with this. People want to get to that island. I want to get to that island. It was hard for me to do this presentation because this was my first slide, and all I could think about was getting to that damn island. And I was like, no, nope, we're going to put together the slides. Right? So you want to get to the island. And what happened before that bridge was there? Well, you could swim there. You'd get pretty wet. Have you ever taken a roller suitcase through the water? Doesn't work out so well. Right? So they built a bridge. And the bridge is sturdy. It keeps you dry. It stands the test of time. It battles the wind. It works in storms. Right? So it works. And all of those attributes that I just named should be true of your product as well. And every person who comes to this island uses that bridge. So lots of people use it. They want it. They all had this problem. They needed to get to the island, so they built a bridge. Right? So we'll, we'll think about a bridge as a metaphor. And five questions that you want to ask yourself as you're building your product. So the first one is, are you focused? Right? What is the problem that you're solving? Well, that one singular problem. Who is that best customer that you're going to solve the problem for? And we'll go over each of these. Second is market size. Is it big? Is it something that's worth building? It's amazing me how many entrepreneurs are focused on problems that are small. And I'm less critical of the problem. I'm more critical of you've got one life, right? Make sure you're working on something that you love and believe in and matters and because it have impact on the world. The third is probably the single most important that I don't see people do. Testing the status quo. What exists today? What do people do? How bad is it? Is it that bad? Right? You should be thinking about this. In the bridge example, it's pretty bad. You show up and you have to swim to the island, right? There's a real problem to solve. The experience, is it going to be awesome? Are you going to create a wow experience? It's not good enough to not have a wow experience today. And then lastly, the timing. You will almost always get asked when you go to pitch your company, why now? I don't really believe that there are new ideas. I believe that people are repurposing old ideas that they've heard, they're rehashing them, they're mashing them up. 
So there's got to be some reason why the 10 people who tried this before you and failed, why did it not work for them and why is it going to work for you? So let's start with the first one. Focus. Focus is so important. The odds are stacked against you in building a startup. Even if you are singularly focused on an audience and experience, you're still probably going to fail. So what do you think happens when you're not focused? You're definitely going to fail. You got no chance. You should stop before you start. Dead on arrival. Right? So focus is really important. And it's getting worse. There's a challenge. So money is getting easier to access. And so you don't have to clear as much of a hurdle to get going. And so you can get this inertia where you get going and you get your initial seed capital and people are excited. You don't really know what you're doing yet, but that's okay. Like people are kind of excited and you're really excited and you've got money and so I got to start building and maybe I should spend some of that money on Facebook and start marketing. And, and I haven't actually figured out who I'm serving and what the product is and clarity around that. And the biggest problem that happens here is the, the bar for what you're trying to build is getting higher. I was at Slide in 2007, so this was eight years ago, and when we, when we raised money at a $500 million valuation, this was front page news. This was crazy, a startup raising money at half a billion dollar valuation, half a billion dollars. Now, maybe you'll get an article on TechCrunch if you do that, right? Like, it seems that that's not good enough. You're not, you're not trying to build a company worth hundreds of millions. Come on, please. All you hear investors say, all you hear in the media, all you see people do is like, is that going to be a billion dollar company? And soon enough, screw a billion dollars. Is that going to be a multi-billion dollar company? Is that worth $10 billion? I'm already starting to see this. It's amazing how quick this inflation is happening for what we value, right? So you now need to build a super unicorn. How do you do that and maintain focus? Well, let's go through one example. Uber. I'm going to use this even though it's among the most overused examples. You guys all know it. You know the company, and so we can talk about it. And we're going to talk about it in a slightly different way. Say that you were building Uber today. Say that it didn't exist. The style that we see most commonly with entrepreneurs today is they come in and they are terrified of not being comprehensive with their long-term plan. So if you came in and you were pitching Uber, what we typically will hear is, well, I'm building this really economical way to get from point A to point B, and I'm building this other product that helps children get to their school safety, safely, and this carpooling product, and this luxury sedan product, and an SUV product for groups, and we might do some food delivery, and imagine what we can do with that delivery system after we get these cars on the road. Like, let me just make sure that I cover everything, right? That's actually the wrong approach. You're almost never going to build a great product with that lack of focus. You would be much better off picking just one. And yet, if you think through, I, I would encourage you to think about yourselves. Think about when you're pitching your own businesses. I bet you're all guilty of this. I'm guilty of this, right? We can't help ourselves. Well, let me do just one more thing. And if somebody doesn't like our pitch or doesn't get it, they must just not have understood it. Maybe we missed one of the features that we're going to build three years from now. Let's go ahead and tell them about it. Let me tell you about that 10 thing I'm going to build. When, when everyone is using my product in the world, let me tell you what I'm going to have, right? And you see people do this all the time. They start, they pitch their product from a point of ubiquity, meaning here's how great my product is going to be when everyone is on it, when everyone has the app downloaded, when everyone is registered for my product. And I always say, what's your day zero experience? When no one's on your product, or what we call cold starts, how does your product behave, right? People struggle. Uh, I don't know how they behave. Well, let me tell you, they're going to behave a lot more clearly, and they're going to have a much better experience and be more engaged if you do one thing and you do it really well, right? It's hard to pull that in, and then it's really hard to make the leap with Uber. You say, well, how would they have stated that building a black car for the everyday person? How would they have stated that to us today as investors? Would they have been able to convince us that that was going to be a $10 billion company? And this is where the challenge is, right? There's friction between those two points of, I want to state something really simply, and I want it to be clear, and I want it to be focused, but at the same time, I have this huge bar that people are trying to get me to overcome. And so you have to tell that story, but start with focus. Start with the one thing that you're going to do really well. Ah, yes, snap terms, snap terms. It is super important that you have a privacy policy and a terms of service on your website, and that's comprehensive, and that you do not break the bank doing it. Every startup needs to have this because if you don't have it in place, there are lawyers out there specifically. These are website chasing, startup chasing 
lawyers, just like there were ambulance chasing lawyers. And they look for startups that raise capital and don't have the terms of service in place. They raise capital. They don't have the privacy policy in place. Then they sue you. And then you settle and you lose your money. Or you can go to Snap Terms right now, snapterms.com, and you can get started for only $299. And you will get a fast, affordable, and simple uh, and comprehensive proper terms and privacy policy. And they can do really um, complex stuff, too, if you were doing something like crowdfunding or you know, commerce, whatever the topics are that you do, they can help you craft that terms of service efficiently and uh, help you avoid costly litigation. And they have very, um, really a great track record. We use them ourselves to save money here and to get uh, defended against and have that proper defense. Thisweekinstartups.com slash legal. Thisweekinstartups.com slash legal to see our legal terms of service. Uh, and you can go to snapterms.com and get started for only $299. And use the promo code TWIST, and you'll take 10% off that as well. It's a great product. Everybody loves it. It's a great solution. Go ahead and thank at Snap Terms, Snap Terms on your Twitter handle. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. This is my favorite slide of all time. It's the thing that people ask me about the most. You only create value in a company in four ways. And maybe there's one more that I'll add at some point. But this is all that I've figured out, is that there are four ways. You either are getting money from users, content, their eyeballs or viewership, or other users. That's it. Those are the only four ways that you create value. Money, content, eyeballs, users. So we'll take an example. Let's talk about Yelp. With Yelp, they get their money from advertisers. To have advertisers, they need viewership. To have viewership, they need users. To get viewership, they build content. Who do you think Yelp's most valuable customers are? The content creators. So it's interesting. A tiny percent of Yelp's customers create content. Those are by far the most valuable users. And so people mistake this all the time. If I say, who's your best customer? The immediate reaction is, well, who pays me the most money? And in some businesses, that is your best customer. In a lot of businesses, customers who don't pay you any money are great. Because they brought 100 of their friends to your site, and each of their friends are paying you money. Or because they create tons of content. right? So you've got to figure out for yourselves what creates a great user on your platform. And you may have different types of great users, but they do it through these four things. So when you go back to that question of, is the thing that I'm working on big enough? This is how you create value. So force yourself to run through this filter. Where am I going to create value? What are the things in my product, in my ecosystem, that are going to be created out of these four? Am I, going to, am I going to get a lot of money from people, tons of eyeballs, a bunch of content that's proprietary that I own that people are going to care about, that they might pay me for or come seek it out? Or are they going to bring me lots of other users that hopefully give me one of the top three? Right? Because users alone don't do this. So it always boils down to the top three or a person bringing in other users that give you one of those top three. Make sense? The third question that you ask on building is the status quo. Accept the fact that it might be good enough, and you might be the only person in the world who thinks that it's not. So what do I mean by this? If you look at a product and you say, in every product that you work on, I would encourage you to ask, what do customers do today? If they don't do anything to get to the end solution, the end goal that you're going to help them towards, they probably don't care that much about it. Before Uber, People still got to their final destination. They just hated the experience. So what is the status quo? How painful is it? Do they really want to fix it? If you made it better, how much better would you need to make it to really stand out from that status quo? Hold yourself to the best alternative that exists in market. And so you guys saw as you were presenting, I asked you lots of questions. You know, what do people do today with groups? Hey, these are the group products that I use. Like, What are you guys doing differently? I don't understand. Around your competition, I think I've seen some other companies that are doing the same thing. What do you guys do really differently? Right? What is the status quo? What exists in market today? How are you different in a meaningful way? And in some businesses, this only needs to be a little bit better. right? So we look at the Apple Watch. There's some really subtle things that you get from the Apple Watch. Probably the most valuable thing that the Apple Watch does for you today is a preview of text messages and emails. Why is that valuable? Well, because today my user behavior when I'm sitting at a dinner or a meeting or anything is my phone vibrates and I think, is that important? How important is this conversation? Can I check that? Is that going to be rude? 
but I'm really curious and I'm distracted and now I want to know and I wish that above the person's head would just float a little preview of who that was. Is that an important call or not? And so it's really hard, right? What time is it? Am I 48 minutes into this one hour meeting? Maybe I should know that. And the Apple Watch does lots of things for me, right? But the thing that it does that's really awesome is it shows me that preview. It's simple. It's not, an, it's not like a separate app. It's not something crazy and magical. But I would argue that's the most useful thing that it does for you today. And maybe it silences your phone, apparently, when you put your hand over the, the face of it. These are pretty basic, simple things, right? So it doesn't need to be a huge improvement in some use cases. The higher the frequency, the less the percentage change needs to be because it's just a pain point that the user hits over and over and over again. If they're only going to use your product once a month or once every year, it better be a hell of a lot better, right? Because it's a considered purchase, a considered engagement. And so you need to have a significant improvement. If you're not sure, ask somebody else who's not you. You care too much. You're in the forest. You're staring at those trees. You're too close to the problem. It's not clear that, that the way you think about the world is the way everybody thinks about it. They probably don't. So ask people, right? Don't ask them why, because they don't actually know. But ask them how they feel about it, right? Ask them if they care. If they don't care, they're probably not going to switch. So uh, I think that it's not good enough to just solve a problem anymore. It's unfortunate. Uh, but the reality is there are so many people working on startups, so many people working on new ideas and new products, that if you solve a problem that's worth solving, chances are there's at least one, two, three other people that are also trying to solve the problem. Three other like, good people, three other people that are going to get funding, that are going to compete with you. And so it can't just be OK. It can't just check the box. It has to be amazing. It has to be incredible. You have to figure out, can you create a wow moment? This is a question that I ask a lot of people that come in that pitch a Series A. They, they go through, I'm like, yeah, this makes sense. This works. You can connect the dots. This, this definitely makes sense to me. Like, I am trying to solve that problem. And I think through it, I'm like, but could you create a wow experience? Because wow experiences are the ones that I tell people about. Wow experiences are the ones that I have affinity towards. Wow experiences are the ones that I remember. Wow experiences are the ones that really get me engaged. And the other experiences are OK, but they're forgettable. And at some point, if, even if they don't exist today, even if you're not competing with them today, someone else will come up with a wow experience in your space if it's possible. And then you've got to figure out what you do. So hold yourself to an extraordinarily high standard. Consumers are expecting this if you're building a consumer product. And enterprise customers, where you used to get to cheat, you used to be able to have crappy software that would just be cloud hosted. And we call that consumerization of the enterprise, right? Same exact software. Same exact thing. Look at NetSuite and tell me that you think that that's easy, beautiful software. It's not, right? It looks like Windows 3.1 dialog boxes, but it was cloud hosted. So we call that consumerization of the enterprise. Oh, this is like a consumer product. No, it's not. It's not at all like that. But today, we're seeing this. So we're investors in Lever. Lever works with applicant tracking systems, helps you track customers. That is truly the next wave. You compare that to Jobvite. You compare that to the people that came before. You're just starting to see a product that you don't have to get trained to use. right? It just makes sense to you. It's a wow experience. And you didn't realize even how bad the products were before it. There were 10 predecessors to Jobvite, if not more. And when Jobvite came out, it was like, oh my god, I can work with my teams. I understand. Like, I have all of the reviews. I have it all in one place. I understand the interview calendar and schedule. That's awesome. And then you see people that really innovate on it, where you don't have to get trained, where you understand the product from day one, and where you enjoy using it. That's the bar, even on enterprise today. So think about how you create that wow moment. So one of the things I learned from Jack was this wow moment. When I joined Square, we were thinking about payment processing. And I have to tell you my default reaction, we had this interesting trade-off where our reader, the swipeability, so the, the percent of times that you swipe and it's successful, was pretty low in the early days. And a huge reason for that was the design. It was a square. We could have immediately improved the uh, accurate swipe rate considerably by making it a rectangle, just by making it a rectangle. 
right? Because a credit card, you have a longer read stripe, a credit card's that shape, it sits across your phone. Or we could have added little feet so that it wouldn't swivel. Swiveling is not a product feature of something that you're trying to keep stationary as you move it, right? We didn't do it. We didn't add those feet. We didn't partner with anyone to create cases that would lock the square in place. We didn't go to a rectangle. We didn't make it huge. Instead, we worked on the hardest possible way to solve the swiper. Let's work on building our own read head. Let's figure out how we can re-engineer the pieces inside this device so that it's just better at reading when the, the square reader moves. We just accepted that the design and beauty of it and experience needed to trump that and that we would eventually get there if we could just engineer our way around it, and we did. Now, that may seem crazy to you. At the time, it seemed crazy to me when I joined the company. But it was really important. Our readers stood out. They're bright white to this day. I was just at Jazz Fest last week in New Orleans, and I walked around, and I was worried I had my little square jacket on. And I was like, oh, people are going to ask me for customer support or, or ask everything. Says every vendor was on square. And the way I knew is I just saw this bright white reader sticking out of people's iPads and their phones, and it was awesome. You know, I love that. I love seeing this. But I remember we used to have black and white readers. We had black ones you could buy and white ones. We only have white ones today. Why do you think that is? They stand out. Because if Square is, looks like two things, what do we put on an ad? What do we put in a television commercial? What do we put on our retail boxes? Well, maybe it's, maybe it's the black square. Maybe it's the white square. Imagine if Apple had two different color Apple logos, right? What do they have? They have a white one. It glows. You recognize it. They used to have a rainbow color one, like what's on my laptop. You recognize it, right? This image, when people look at it, represents Apple. It's a singular image. And so that was really important for us. We wanted it to stand out. So it's all about creating this wow experience. The Golden Gate Bridge is probably the best example of this. The Golden Gate Bridge solves a problem. You have to get across the water, right? But yet, it's a beautiful approach at solving that problem. It's an experience. How many other bridges do people stop and take pictures of? This is the most photographed bridge in the world. It's the 14th most visited attraction in the world. Attraction. People go to a damn bridge. This is crazy. 13 million people a year go to this bridge. Not to go across it, to visit it, to take its picture, to say I went there, right? Not because 13 million people are trying to go from Marin County over to San Francisco. <laughs> like, this is crazy. It's a bridge. And they could have built it in lots of different ways, but they decided to build it this way, really thoughtfully, right? They thought it couldn't be done. And the problem was real. So if we go through our questions, was the problem real? Do you think so? Did they just build this bridge for art? No. San Francisco was the last major American city serviced primarily by ferries. We got our water via ferry. Soon enough, we're going to be getting our water via ferry as well, just from a different place. <laughs> we got our water via ferry. It took 20 minutes on the shortest destination, the, the shortest trip from Sausalito over to the pier, 20 minutes to get across. Limited capacity. Monopolistic ownership of the ferries. All sorts of problems, right? So they decided to build this bridge. Bridge is pretty useful. But it's not just a bridge, right? It's a beautiful experience. It's a wow moment. Hold yourself to that standard. It's not acceptable to present a product that doesn't look good, that doesn't feel good, that your users don't love with, that fall in love with. You will not build an amazing company if you do that, right? You have to solve a real problem, but it also has to feel amazing in the process. And you can do it. You can totally do it. Hey, everybody, let me take a moment to thank our friends at Citrix GoToMeeting. I mean, gosh, think about all the time and money and hassle it takes to hold these meetings. My God, you're going down to the valley, up to San Francisco, uh, the traffic, the cost, the flying places. And my recommendation is that you meet your clients and coworkers over Citrix's go-to meeting. It is a smarter way to meet, and it has beautiful HD faces, amazing HD quality. I just did an all hands with my uh, team from inside.com, and it was perfect. Everybody had crystal clear VoIP, or they were dialing in. 
and people were on different platforms. Some people were on their smartphones, some people were on tablets, some people were on desktop computers. And you know what? I have a real thing. I want everybody to have like a headset on, and some people forgot their headsets, and it still sounded really good. Uh, it's really the most professional uh, meeting project product on the market. It's very affordable. I've had it for many, many years. I think I'm close to a decade using GoToMeeting. And I want you to try it and sign up for GoToMeeting today. You'll get it free for 30 days. You have nothing to lose. So visit GoToMeeting.com, click the Try It Free button. And if you do it now, uh, your first meeting will be up and running uh, in just minutes. And that's GoToMeeting, and uh, your first 30 days are free. It's a fantastic product. You can also, it has a chat room in it, which is also a nice feature. Uh, I like to have somebody take notes and put it in the chat room. You can also record the audio from it in case you want to share that with everybody. And you know what? I do that as well. It's a fantastic product. Thank you, GoToMeeting. Let's get back to this amazing episode. So the next question is, why now? This is the timing question. It's the last question. You're going to get asked it a lot. Just understand it. Understand that that investor that you're talking to or the people you're talking to have been pitched this idea before in some version They've heard about it, they think they've heard about it. You think it's novel, they think it's tired. You've got to figure out what that is, but you have to have a really good answer for why now is the moment where you will succeed. I look at Instacart and I just can't help but think about this, right? We used to have a grocery delivery service, I think. I'm, I'm pretty sure. And then that became like the bunt of every joke. Every single joke, right? What did you say? Oh, Webvan, oh, amazing. Oh, and then we have Peapod and we have this and we have that, right? And it used to be like, this is impossible. You can't possibly build a big business there. And it wasn't that long ago, like five years ago, that people were pitching grocery delivery and investors were going, you can't, I'm sorry, do you not remember the past? Why now? Why does it work? Right? But yet, Instacart just raised more money, you know, huge company. How do they do it? Well, what do you think they recognize? What was their why now moment? Any ideas? One, mobile phones. The bigger one, the workforce, right? We've never, so we can connect people with mobile phones in stores who aren't necessarily our employees. And those people can connect with our end customers. So instead of having to have refrigerated delivery vans, huge infrastructure costs, and, and have this whole system set up, we can rely on people who can talk to other people and, and deal with the intricacies of their requests, right? That just had never been done before. We had never been able to mobilize people in that way. I just saw a package that delivered via OnTrack. I don't know if you guys have ever seen OnTrack's delivery system or you're familiar with it. They do a ton of Amazon packages. It, it basically looks like a random person is pulling up to your house. They might have an OnTrack magnet on the side of their car, if you're lucky, but literally this white unmarked beat up van pulled up outside and I had no idea what was going on. Like maybe it was a mobile meth lab, I wasn't sure. Um, and all of a sudden this guy comes up to the front door, not in a uniform, nothing. Comes to the front door of this package. It's not, it wasn't for me, just drops it on the front. And I said, oh, uh, is, that, is that for me? No, I'm just gonna leave it here. Oh, okay, great, all right. Gets back in his van and drives off. There are challenges with this workforce of having <laughs> new people that are not necessarily employees and aren't uniformed and aren't this and aren't that. There are benefits of it, right? And so figuring out how to manage that, the, the real goal came from how did Instacart get this new type of person, this new resource, to still deliver a wow experience, right? So it's not enough to just find that unlock. Then you've got to go back. You have to make sure you've answered all those questions. Somehow they get that wow experience and some people are doing it and some people aren't, right? Some people are paying attention to that. So I would think through those things. So you have these five questions that you go through, your focus, your market size, the status quo, making sure that you stack up to the next best alternative and not just stack up, but that you significantly beat it. You think through the experience and making sure that it's a wow, captivating, amazing experience. And then you think about the timing. Why is now the time to do it? Why are you going to win, particularly if other have, others have failed or failed miraculously? like in a big, splashy web van kind of way before you, be able to speak to those things. The second piece is messaging. Now, messaging is different than marketing. What is, what is the difference between messaging and marketing? It's the idea of it. It's delivering the idea in a direct and simple manner. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. Messaging is how you communicate what you do, how you explain it. Marketing is once you've figured out the messaging, how you get that message to your target audience. So I may be able to really clearly explain what I do, but I don't know how to tell people about it. I don't know where they are. I don't know where my target customer is. I don't have a way to access them. I may have no clue how to explain my product, and this is more common, but I know all the channels. So I go ahead and use the channels with my broken message, right? And this is the number one mistake that I see people make. They're spending money hand over fist, and they haven't tested their message. They just have no idea if people understand what product they're selling. So, so how do you do this? How do you craft that message? Three things. Be really clear. Say what you mean. Speak to the inner child in your audience, right? And there's an asterisk. The, the asterisk, I would say, is if you're building enterprise software, don't dumb it down too much. You don't want to be in super layman terms where they think that you're not operating at their level or that you're not an advanced enough product for them. But I have yet to see a pitch or anyone explain their product to me and think, huh, that was too simple. Like, that should be more complicated. You should confuse me a little bit more. You know? You can almost always simplify it. The second is be concise. Keep it simple. People are just not paying attention for that long. You don't have that much time. They're distracted. There's other things going on in their lives. You can barely pause, right? So keep it really, really short. And then captivate your audience. So ideally, you want to connect with people on an emotional level. Ideally, you don't want typos in your slides. So you want to connect with people on an emotional level. And you want to make them care about it. So how do you do this? Well, you create that wow experience. If you create an experience that's incredible, they're going to understand it. They're going to resonate with it. They're going to remember it. And then you've got to figure out, how does that message communicate that? How does it communicate something that they're going to care about? If they care about it, they're going to remember it. They're going to act on it. Right? So you want, to, you want to reach through that screen, or that billboard, or that wrapped car, or that t-shirt, and you want to figure out how you get to something you care about. Maybe it's funny, maybe it's quirky, maybe it's emotional, who knows? So I want to harp on you about this conciseness. You guys have heard the term elevator pitch. I've actually started to hear it less often, which scares me, because the level of, we, we talked about the level of complexity of products and the bar is going up. But elevator pitches exist for a reason. You've got 30 seconds. So the, the term elevator pitch was devised of you get in the elevator, and the person you're trying to sell to happens to get in the elevator with you, and you only have the time that it takes to get to their floor. And then they're leaving. How do you pitch yourself? It's a pretty good test. I would argue that every great company that you guys love and use, you can explain in one sentence, and you're less likely to be able to explain your own company in one sentence. That's crazy. And if you think, I shouldn't be able to explain my company in one sentence, how can you explain a multi-billion dollar company in one sentence if you can't explain your own? Right? You're trying to be overly comprehensive. And in saying everything, you kind of say nothing. Amazon, it's a place that I can buy everything easily. Facebook, it's where I connect with people. Google, I can find anything on the internet. Now, am I explaining every one of their product lines? No. But you have to be able to explain the core of your product. What it is you're building, why people should care about it, what it does in one sentence. Hold yourself accountable to that. Why? Because you have no idea when these opportunities come. You have no idea who happens to get in the elevator with you, or sit next to you on the airplane, or go to break with you, or be at the bathroom with you washing their hands. You have no idea how much time you have. But you certainly don't have an hour. And I'm amazed when, when I talk to entrepreneurs and they start explaining their business to me, and we go into the pitch, we're like 20 minutes in. And I say, OK, I get it. So like, you, guys are, you guys are doing this and doing that. And they're like, no, 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 no. You don't get it. We do this. We do this. If we have to go back and forth too much, you can blame me for it. Maybe I'm the idiot. You know? But I think it's probably around the messaging. It's probably that I just don't understand what you do. And if it takes you more than five minutes to tell me what you do, something is broken. Right? So keep yourself to this standard. Like, you have to be super concise. One sentence and test it. How many of you guys think you have your message figured out? Whoa. OK, one person. Have you tested it? How did you test it? Uh, a, B, C, D, E, X. I mean, we, we play with so many 
because of messaging. But to who? Where? How did you? Uh, we used Facebook ads. We used uh, we used survey tools. Okay. Uh, we tested the the driver demographic that we've gone after after we figured out what that demographic was. We tested it to the advertiser demographic after we figured out what that was. And we we basically used uh, the cost of acquisition as a gauge. Sure. So, so that is a really good, more advanced way of testing it, though it has a fatal flaw. And, and we'll talk about that in a second. There's a much simpler way. Tell someone about it. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you who doesn't work on your product and tell them what you do in one sentence. And then ask them to tell the person next to them what you do. And listen. And they will tell them all of the wrong things. Actually. Spend a few minutes. Describe your whole business to them. Get them to really understand it, or so you think. And then give them a few minutes to tell the person next to them what you do. And listen to all of the wrong things that they say, all the things that you don't actually do, all of the problems you don't actually solve. It is amazing to me. This is the easiest way to test your message. You just tell somebody what you do, and you listen to what they think they heard. If they don't say back to you what you do, your message probably isn't very clear. Now, you need to test this across a number of people, but you're going to get directional feedback. Like, I really don't understand what you do. Or I kind of get it, I'm a little off. This will be the cleanest, easiest, simplest, cheapest way for you to figure it out. Go stand on Market Street. You got thousands of people walking by. Hey, would you mind helping me out? A couple minutes. They have no clue what you do. Ask them, right? Or ask people, not in here because you pitch them, but ask people that are in the broader community. Ask your friends. right? Hold yourself accountable to this. And then, once you feel like you have that message figured out, the problem is that the people that you asked maybe aren't your target customer. They're the lay consumer. right? So if you have a specific niche, a specific customer you're going after, this isn't going to be the perfect way to do it, but it gives you some directional feedback. It helps you simplify that message. I mean, you can definitely get your target market to understand it if you can get any random person to understand it. So it's a really good way to do it. But the second is to use ads, like what you've done. Use ads to test that message. The one challenge that people have is they generally don't put their analytics deep enough to actually come to the right message. The right message is not the thing that gets you the most clicks. So you can put a bunch of ads and you can have them go to different landing pages or the same landing pages. I tell people to do this with pricing all the time. Test pricing before you change pricing. Do promotional pricing. Have it land on a page that gives those customers that special pricing. But you can test this message. But clicks aren't the right way to test it. And that's generally what people do. Why? Get a million dollars if you click this button. You're going to get lots of clicks. And that is an extreme example. But you actually do those things with words. You use sex to sell. You use something really exciting. You use something that is really time sensitive, a current event. And people click it. They're aware of it. But it doesn't last. It doesn't stand the test of time. And it doesn't actually generate high value customers. So you want to track all the way through. You got to think back to where do you create value? Who are those best customers, the ones that give you the most value? How do you track those people? I want to know what message gets me the most people that are actually the highest value customer. What's the highest ROI message? And I want to test it at scale. And ads let me do that. So just make sure that if you are going to use ads, track it all the way through to understand what the ROI is on those customers. Because you may be really good at messaging that creates a bunch of customers that just don't add any value. So be careful with that. Now let's talk about what the big brands do. The big brands are really good with their slogans. Because this message has been honed over and over and over again. It's been twisted and turned into something cool and inspirational and something memorable. BMW, the ultimate driving machine. Walmart, save money, live better. Whoa, I saw that. I was like, that is a great slogan. Like, I was just curious. What's a, I didn't know what Walmart's was. Levi's, quality never goes out of style. Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. Donald, McDonald's, I'm loving it. These are slogans that are really clear. They represent the brand. They say lots of things. They get you to feel a certain way. So we talked about clarity, conciseness, and connection. right? These are what we talked about in messaging. I'm loving it. I'm loving this. And I feel like hip, like it's not loving, it's loving. right? 
It's, it's so hip that people are using it in movies and they're referencing this. You have McLovin, you have this. It, it is amazing how these things are then used. The happiest place on earth. This is probably the tagline that I've heard more than anything else in my life. I have no question of where I will be happy and fulfilled and nothing bad happens in the world. It's at Disneyland. It's certainly not at SeaWorld. So when I think about this, save money and live better. That's exactly what Walmart wants me to think. I get stuff, it's cheap, I'm gonna save money, and my life is gonna be better? This is amazing, wow. It's incredible, who wouldn't like that? Brands do a really good job of this. The challenge is when they go into advertising. And what they're doing is the thing that you're doing. They're, they're going back to this, this more elementary state, right? A new product, a new launch, a new angle. They're constantly looking for ways to reinvent themselves. And so they use ads and messaging, and that's where they're in a similar place to you. You're like, I have a brand new product. How do I present it to the world? How do I make it captivating and exciting? How do I get it to sell? How do I get people excited about it? Let's look at these. I work with my ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend. Who the hell's message is this? And what are they selling? Is polyamory now a product that's a financial services product I didn't know about? Like, what is going on here? They, they make me wear a hat every day. It looks like a chicken and yes, it clucks. Deep fryer in the background. These are financial services products from co-op. Why would they do th this? doesn't make any sense. Why do they message in this way? They're trying so hard to get you to pay attention. They're trying so hard to break, break through the clutter. You don't build a nursery with dirt. Union Bank. What do, I, what do I build it with? Checking accounts? Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what that message is saying. This one's a lot better. Think no one's lending? Think again. We are. We're a bank. We lend money. Come to our website. Visit our branch. Right? Sometimes you just have to hit the customer over the head with the message. You can get a little too creative for your own good. And then context really matters. So this is cool. There's a travel site. It's this cool campaign, my ultimate bucket list. What are the places I want to travel, things I want to go. Have any of you guys seen this ad before? This was the website. This was the top line messaging for this travel company. And it was amazing. What's, what's my ultimate bucket list? What do you want to do before you die? I do not want to ride on Malaysian Airlines before I die. <laughs> this happened after they had two fatal crashes. How thoughtless can you be? How, how little context can you have? They ran a contest for people to submit places they wanted to visit before they died within a year of having fatalities and injuries on their flights that were among the most broadly publicized. There's another ad just like this, which is an airplane on an escalator going towards the ground. Right? So you have to think about all of these things. What's the context? What's the medium? How are people going to interpret this? And then the last thing on messaging is something that I hadn't really thought about before I joined Square, but I talked to a founder about this yesterday, and he's in the business of uh, college preparatory tests. And it was, for him, he's like, oh my god, this is a major unlock. So it's not just financial service products. People just don't trust you. The average consumer just doesn't trust you. Because there are a lot of you. And there's a lot of people outside this room. And there's a lot of brands that have existed before you. And everyone's trying to sell them something. And oftentimes, it's not so great, right? So you don't have trust from the get-go. You have to earn it. And if you don't have trust, you can have an amazing message that's really clear and concise and emotional and makes sense. I just don't believe you when you say it. I don't believe your food is healthy. I don't believe that your flights are cheap. I don't believe that your hotel is good quality. Right? You can tell me these messages. They're very clear. I understand. I just don't believe you. So what do you think you do? How do you overcome this? Any thoughts? What can you do? Deliver. Deliver. Sure. So you can deliver. And after you deliver, you have to tell the world that you delivered. Testimonials. Testimonials. Other people's voices. So let me tell you how we did this at Square. So the first thing was we got Visa to invest. Visa is a brand 
particularly in financial services, that represents trust. More people have a Visa card in their wallet than any other card, right? They trust them. They trust them with their money. And Visa trusted us. And so, if you trust Visa and Visa trusts us, eh, maybe you trust us. And then we've got a, a bunch of other big name investors, and they trusted us. And they put millions of dollars into our company. And if they trusted us and Visa trusted us, then maybe you would trust us. And then we delivered on that experience, right? And we told the world about it. You can see some of this is just around getting funding, but some of this is around the experience that we delivered, right? And so this middle is around press. Press was probably the single most important thing in the early days of Square beyond designing the right product. When we were 30 people, we had three full-time people working on press. That's the largest percentage I've ever heard of at any startup. 10% of the staff working on PR. That's crazy. But we were fighting an uphill battle. No one believed us. We were going against the industry. Why? Because people do not trust banks and financial service providers. They constantly feel like they're getting taken advantage of and scammed. And they get postcards that say fees as low as 1.5% to process credit cards. As low as. And they just have stopped trusting what they read. So we had to figure out how do we get people that they trust to tell them it's okay to trust us. And then the last one on the right is Molly from Molly Moons, an ice cream store. We got her to have a great experience and then we said, hey, do you mind if, would, would you mind sharing that experience? Would you mind telling the world? And so if you go to Square's website today, you'll see Molly's on the website with her testimonials, her, her picture. When I was at Square, we started in our ads with saying all of our brand promises. Here's our pricing, no contracts, no termination fees, all these things. And we did a survey. We were thinking about changing pricing. So we went out to people, not our customers. We went out to random people. And it was blind. They didn't know that we worked for Square. And we called them. And we said, hey, can we talk to you for a little bit? All small businesses. And we talked to them about our product. And we said, hey, you know, do you do credit card processing? Yes or no? Went through the whole thing. And we asked them about what price would make them want to use a product, what price would make them want to switch. And what's amazing is overwhelmingly, they said that the price that Square was offering was the one that would not just make them want to use a product, but would make them want to switch. If only a company offered what you just said, that 2.75% and no fixed fee, no termination fee, no, no other things, like, oh, I would switch right now. Every time I touch this machine, I'm paying money. I would love to switch. Unfortunately, nobody offers that, and we would respond. Um, well, you know, we've been doing some research. There's this company called Square. Have you heard of them? Sometimes they had, sometimes they hadn't. You know, that pricing is their pricing. What do you think they said? No, it's not. No, um, pretty sure it's their pricing. Nope, not their pricing. Do you, are you in front of a computer? Would you mind just... We can load their website. I just want to make sure we're talking about the same, same company, Square, right? Square does payments. Yeah, just go to the website. On our home page, our pricing. You see that pricing? 2.75%, no fixed fee. Yeah, but then they're going to charge you a termination fee. But you see the text right under that says no termination fee. Yeah, but you're locked in this on contract. Yeah, but under that they say there, there's no contract. You can't believe them. You can't trust them. They're all lying to you. Don't, you know, they're trying to get you. They'll put it on their home page. It's a pack of liars. It was amazing. Our pricing wasn't the problem. Our message was not the problem. They just didn't believe who it was coming from. This was a huge breakthrough for us. So what did we do? We switched from us telling our story. And our ads, we started to use merchant narratives, merchant stories. That became our arc. So when we did television spots, we filmed merchants. We filmed real merchants talking about their use of Square for hours because you can't tell them what you want them to say. It's not legal. So you have to just film them talking about the product and their experience. Right? So we filmed them for hours. And there were all of these magic moments that came out of those hours. Messages that I would have never thought to say. Messages that I couldn't say. They're not available to me. I can't say you'll have a magical experience. You won't even know how you ran your business without Square. If you don't believe my pricing, which I'm actually charging you, you certainly aren't going to believe that because that's totally subjective. But the person who could tell them that is the hairdresser, who truly believes that. And she did. 
And if you look at those TV spots, you see, she says, Square just makes it so easy. I couldn't even imagine my business, I couldn't imagine running my business without it. And then she giggles at the end. It's like, I couldn't, I loved it. I saw this clip and I was like, yes, we're gonna use this, right? You can't write that, you can't script it. It's not your words and it only works coming from her. It only were coming from our merchants. So we moved a lot of our advertising over to merchant narratives. We let them tell our stories. And this isn't unique to Square. If you look at LegalZoom, you're gonna see this. You'll get Angie's List. You're gonna see all of these companies that use testimonials to talk about the experiences that their customers have. And it's a huge way to gain trust. And the last piece, which we're not gonna talk about, is marketing. So after you've done these other two things, right, you've figured out how to build the right product. You've held yourself accountable to the principles of what is required, what the bar is, the true bar of market today, to build a product that really matters in the world, that's really gonna be impactful, that creates a lot of value, right? After you've gone through all of that, then you figure out, I know how to, how to tell it to people, I know how to sell it to people, how to get them to understand what it is. I've tested my messaging and they get it. When I say what I do, they say back to me what I do. When I tell them to tell their friends, they tell their friends. That's really useful if you ever hope to have some sort of viral component to your product, right? And once I've succeeded at it, then I can start to think about the marketing channels. I can start to think about how to capture that message, how to combine it with creative, who should tell that message, how I describe my product in the format and constraints of advertising, and all the channels I'm gonna use, right? Then I can start on that journey. But then the day, you've gotta build and message it first, and then you get to marketing. And that's it.